Welcome to the Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. Aren't you glad you're here? If you're glad you're here, say amen. amen. <laughs> this is the place to be. This is where you belong. This is where you are loved. You who are youth today, you're visiting us. You are included, you are loved, and you are online, you belong here. And we all gather together here to worship God. We worship uh, with one voice. We worship uh, with the best people in the world, some of the best people in the world, right here. <laughs> Speaking of the world, our hearts are heavy as we pray for Ukraine. On the altar, you'll see a, a yellow flowers and a blue ribbon symbolizing the flag of Ukraine. And following the benediction for the post salute, Ashley will play their national anthem. And I suggest that you remain standing after the benediction as a sign of solidarity with the uh, Ukrainian people. Open your hearts and let us worship. Please stand as you are able. Today marks the second Sunday in the season of Lent, a period of preparation leading up to Easter. It's a time when faithful followers of Jesus are called to focus on prayer, fasting, and generosity. I invite you to join me in our call to worship as we continue this journey with one another. The psalmist sings, one thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in God's temple. Sisters and brothers, God is good, and in love and mercy greets us here.
Please be seated. Our psalm reading this week is from the Psalm 27, verses 7 to 14. Listen for the word of the Lord. Lord, listen to my voice when I cry out. Have mercy on me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek God's face. Lord, I do seek your face. Please don't hide it from me. Don't push your servant aside angrily. You have been my help. God who saves me, don't neglect me. Don't leave me all alone. Even if my father and mother left me all alone, the Lord would take me in. Lord, teach me your way. Because of my opponents, lead me on a good path. Don't give me over to the desires of my enemies because false witnesses and violent accusers have taken their stand against me. But I have sure faith that I will experience the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Hope in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite all the kids to come up front with me for our children's moment. spring break this week no school for any of you this week what are you gonna do oh it's the end of spring break did you do anything really fun you went to Hawaii oh. Pastor Daddy, I think we need a staff <laughs> retreat to Hawaii <laughs> all right well I'm so glad you're here today so the first thing I want to do because I know you're all super smart so I want you to help me with some opposite so what's the opposite of fast slow what about the opposite of big small or little what about the opposite of friendly mean or unfriendly what about the opposite of alive alive dead so what do I have in my hand an orange yeah it's a toy orange it doesn't but it's supposed to be an orange right so does anyone know, how long does it take when you plant an orange tree for it to start having fruit? A long, a long time? Like, do you have a guess? More than, my, more, than my brain can more than your brain can handle this morning? <laughs> so when we planted an orange tree, I think it took about, there were three years that it didn't have any fruit, and then in the fourth year we started to get an orange. So during that time, did we still have to water the tree and keep it alive? Yeah. And even though it didn't have fruit, was it dead? No. <laughs> no, we still poured into it and took care of it. And that's what God wants us to be like. How do we take care of our faith and keep it going, even when sometimes we might not see the fruit just yet? What are some things you maybe do at home that help you be faithful? <laughs> be nice to your sister? Maybe. <laughs> what about, do any of you guys pray at home? Yeah, what else can you guys do in your lives to help bear fruit for God? It's a tough question. What about just coming to Sunday school and church and being friendly with other people? Yeah, well, that's great. I'm so glad you guys are here with me today. So let's pray together, friends. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together today for trips, for fun for rest, help us to bear fruit in our lives. Amen. All right, and now our preschool friends, we're gonna go to Sunday school, and everyone else, you've got your worship bingo cards.
The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? With humble hearts, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me in our prayer of confession as it appears on the screen. Merciful God, you have made us citizens of heaven, but we confess that we have set our minds on earthly things. We have let our desire for security restrain our commitment to serve the poor. We have let our fear of danger curb our obligation to love our enemies. We have let our love of things dull, our generosity to the needy. We have let our craving for public status prevent our honesty about hidden sins. Yet you know the desires of our heart, and nothing is hidden from you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, conform our sin-weakened bodies to the glory of Christ. We may be the body of Christ for the world. Amen. Let us pray in silence. I invite you to take a moment of silent reflection, opening yourself to all that God has to show you. O oh God, our light and our salvation does not forsake us or leave us with our sin. In Christ we are forgiven and offer the gift of healing repentance. Thanks be to God. As we enter into our time of offering, I want to remind you that you can support the very important missions and vision of our church by placing a gift in the offering plate as it is passed. Or you can visit pvumc.org slash give now. Christ has given his life for us. I 
shall close in death. When I saw two worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in Let me hide myself. Let me hide myself in God, we give you these gifts, gifts that come from our resources and from our hearts. And we pray that, that you would help us to use them to spread your message of love and peace and community in our world. And all God's people said, amen. Let's be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke. 9 verses 1 to 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He replied, do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the past three years and I've never found any. Cut it down. Why should I continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, then you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Monica. What you all don't know about that scripture is that it's the wrong one. And uh, it's next week's scripture. And I asked Monica, Monica to please change it. And the reason is, um, even though I did all my my notes and studying, um, um, even in my notes, I have this week's scripture written down. My study went to next week's scripture, and I didn't realize that I had made this mistake until like 9.30 last night. So I didn't want to work another sermon in, and so I'll preach on this, this week's scripture next week. And uh, as I look at all the places that I studied and wrote, including my, my notes on my iPad, I think about, well, like, this week's scripture was everywhere. Why did I keep going to next week's scripture, especially when I don't really like it? I don't think you're going to like this sermon. 
I mean, I didn't like it either. But it, it, it's what I love about Scripture, right? <laughs> it challenges us and makes us think about things in different ways, ways that perhaps we wouldn't if we were on our own. So I named, I titled this scripture, Abandoned Houses, which you'll see in next week's scripture. <laughs> that, that title has come straight out of the scripture, and I kept, when I was studying, saying, where are the abandoned houses? I knew it, they were in the scripture. But then I remembered what I had seen on, on my social media screens this week. Perhaps you saw some too. Pictures of abandoned houses. They're heartbreaking to see, and maybe you came to church today just wanting to escape the pictures we've seen all week. But I'm sorry uh, to not give you that opportunity this week, because this is Lent. And Lent is a season of the Christian year when we dive deep into our faith and we find out the things that, that need to change. We choose to get real with ourselves during, during Lent, which means we don't make up stories about how good things are or how perfect I am or how everyone wants to be around me. We stop lying to ourselves and to God during Lent. This is the time when we allow ourselves to be humble to see ourselves in a way that we begin to understand that we have a need to repent before God. This is the season for repentance and reflection. Remember how we started out this season on Ash Wednesday saying, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We start out this, saying, this season saying we, we are dust, we are dirty, we are earthly, we are death. That's how we begin the season. That, that's our, our attempt at getting real. So on your screens, perhaps this week, uh, you saw pictures of lines of families, women and children who left, who abandoned their homes, walked in lines uh, of people to crowded, overcrowded train stations and just hoped to be one of the ones who got onto the train that day. Perhaps you saw images of houses being blown up or the image that I saw that was haunting to me especially as I heard Josh play today of a woman um, whose house had been bombed and they were leaving but she took the cover off her piano before they left and played a piano piece covered it up and walked out the door these images are are, are, are hard for, for us to see they, they jerk at our emotions. But I want to I wanna grant you one more image of a story that I read of a sister who lives in Ukraine. She's Russian, living in Ukraine, and I believe she's taken Ukraine on as her country. And she was having a conversation with her sister who lives in Russia. And her Russian sister had a different view of things than the Ukrainian sister. And the Ukrainian sister was trying to convince her Russian sister otherwise and they ended up in a verbal sparring and and in the end they broke their relationship because they couldn't agree on what was happening in their world i think that pain the pain of a broken relationship with your family member is even deeper than the pain of an abandoned house these images are hard for us to see just as hard as it is to say and to remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. So when we see these images this week, it's hard to think that, it's hard, or it's easy to think that we have a good reason to have self-righteous anger. I, I know I felt it myself. I had all the plans in my mind of how we could stop this, and it wasn't pretty. And I had to remind myself more than a few times of the stories my mother told me of the year that she spent in Russia and how lovely the people were to her and how they welcomed her into her home, their homes as they studied the Bible together. And I showed someone this week, we had a visitor over, and I showed her my Russian teapots that my mother had brought home. She asked them about them. What are those, where are those teapots for? And I told her how my mom brought us each a teapot. She, my mom loves tea, and she brought us each teapot home, and I had mine, and then 
when I cleaned out her house, I got another one. And another thing that she brought us home was the Russian dolls, stacked dolls. We called them babushka dolls, which are, babushka means grandmother or old woman. But I looked it up, and they're actually called matryoshka dolls. They, they, they represent a mother's fertility. So matryoshka means mother instead of grandmother. And because they're stacked dolls, a doll inside of a doll inside of a doll inside of a doll, inside of a doll each one painted beautifully, um, they represent a mother's fertility. So I remembered my mom's time there and all the representations of the Russian culture that I have in my home, and I had to stop and pause. Am I making an enemy of a whole group of people because of my felt self-righteous anger? When we begin to think of our enemies, we have to be careful that we are not turning whole groups of people into the other without first looking inside ourselves. And, and I think that's what Jesus was trying to do. He was trying to say to his hometown buddies, remember he was in Galilee, who were just talking about the terrible things that were happening, happening in their day to their friend Jesus. They were just um, commiserating. They mentioned, for example, how awful it is that a murder was committed in their town, in the sacred space of their temple, and, and they were saying how angry that made them. That would make me mad. But Jesus didn't respond in the way that they wanted him to. He didn't get mad. He didn't join in even in the conversation, though he might have felt some of that anger. He didn't imbibe in the nationalistic fervor against the evil enemy. He doesn't even address their evil. Instead, he pl instead of playing the game that they were playing, the game of moral superiority with his homies, he retorts perhaps rudely. This is one of the scriptures you could just say Jesus was just rude. He says, those Galileans that suffered, do you think they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Because in those days, if you died in a tragic way, it was because of your sin. So were they worse sinners than the rest of us in this room, he was saying? And then he went on to add, he said, and what about all the innocents who were building that tower at Salome when it, cr when it crashed, this, this terrible thing that happened in our community? Were they any worse than the others who were not crushed? So I'm sure the, the disciple, the, the people, who, his friends who were talking to him were pretty confused, shaking their, set, their heads and saying, Jeez, Jesus, what does that have to do with anything? Or maybe they're thinking, well, that was rude. Where's your compassion? Actually, that was my first uh, reaction to this scripture. That was rude, Jesus. Where's your compassion for all these people who died? Jesus had asked them a rhetorical question, which, of course, they didn't answer, but he answered it for them. Remember, the, the question was, were they any worse than those who had not been crushed. And Jesus said, no. As in no, their sin didn't make bad things happen to them. As in no, this idea that you've had in your culture, sometimes it still exists in ours, is not true. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. Again, his friends must have been shaking their heads and thinking, what does repentance have to do with anything we're talking about? I wonder if Jesus heard self-righteous condemnation beneath the retelling of a horrible act of the enemy. Because if your culture taught you that bad things happen to bad people who, who sin, and if you find yourself judging others who sin, then we need to remember that Jesus spoke to that idea. And he said to us to look at the log in our own eyes before gossiping about the speck in our neighbor's eyes. And I wonder also if it goes, that if, if, um, if that speck in our neighbor's eyes or that log in our neighbor's eyes could be expounded to a speck or a log in our enemy's eyes because Jesus told us to love our enemies. I told you you weren't going to like it. 
We live in this moment in history when we see all the horror that can happen in other places of, of the world. Meanwhile, we forget the horrors that have happened at our own hands. And I think that was Jesus' point. Can I tell you a few of them that are a long time ago so you won't get too mad? I won't tell you the ones that are recent. I'll let you figure those out. A long time ago, we took land away from the native people, even this land that we stand on today. A long time ago, we built our country on the backs, the bodies, and the souls of Africans who we enslaved. Today, we live on the land that used to belong to Mexico. So when we look at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, without looking at our own history and at what we have done in our long time past and what we still continue to do today, when we look at our own needs instead of the needs of the other and the needs of the world, then we too develop enemies. And when we, when we see that happening someone else, somewhere else across the world, it's really easy to point the fing finger. Well, Ryan, what this scripture is saying is, okay, yes, that's awful. But what about you? We've lived on expansionist ideas and have wanted to expand our frontier. And we do so at the expense of other families whose stories we fail to tell. And we have told stories to our children that are only partially true about our history. And we have left out the horrors that belong to us. When I wrote that part, I thought, they're never going to want me to preach there again. <laughs> and I remember even at 9-11 that day when that terrible thing happened in our country, uh, an, an automatic response that came up in, in me was, oh, God, forgive us for the ways we hurt each other. And I think maybe Jesus is wanting his friends to, to remember that yes, awful things happen and yes, we have to do something about them when they happen and when we can, but don't be the social justice person out there making changes if you can't first make the change inside yourself. Thankfully, about this time in the scripture when the friends were just wondering what was wrong with Jesus, he pivots and starts talking about an, uh, a seemingly unconnected topic. He tells the story of the fig tree. He says a man owned a, owned a fig tree, and notice that it hadn't produced fruit for three years. So he told the gardener, hey, this fig tree hasn't produced for three, three years. I've been watching it. Why don't you cut it down? Why should it continue to take up space and valuable nutrients in the soil? But the gardener begged the owner to give it one more year. And the gardener said, I will give it special attention by digging around the ground around it, and I will give it fertilizer, and then if it doesn't produce, you can chop it down. So many people make much ado about the mercy shown in this parable, assuming the owner gave the gardener another year, but you notice in the scripture, it doesn't say that he did or not. And many people make much ado about the manure that is spread over the base of the plant, but that is the normal caretaking for plants. They take our waste and make nutrients out of them. But I'd like to make much ado about the fact that Jesus leaves this story hanging. He doesn't resolve it for us. It's as if we are left to figure out what is needed to make the tree produce fruit, to produce figs. Maybe some tilling some digging up of the dirt that we think belongs to us, but really is the stuff of creation, the beautiful, dirty, muddy grit of our lives. Maybe the gardener, Jesus, will come and move around some stuff so that new, fresh air can get in and the possibility of growth in the root system is present. Or maybe we do need to take some manure and put it in its proper place. <laughs> Mix it up with the dirt so that it can transform itself from the waste product to life-giving nutrients for the soil of our lives to grow again. We have plenty of manure in our lives. But it's what we do with it that matters. 
And interesting enough, what Jesus said that we need to do about all the troubles we see in our enemies and our unearned tragedies is to stop looking at them alone, but instead use them to turn around, to repent, and look at how we can make our own lives better. Because that is something we can do. We may feel helpless in the eyes of a war, but we're not helpless in our own lives. We can be part of the change that creates a world where war is not needed, where abandoned houses are not a thing. But it means we have to look inside and we have to be honest and we have to, we have to repent. Repentance means we didn't get everything right. Repentance means the answers that we have aren't working too well. Repentance means finding the humility that comes with dirt and manure and asking God for another chance, even just another year. I could be wrong about these comments of Jesus, but I think that was what he was trying to tell us. And maybe the reason I couldn't put this scripture down this week is because we still need to hear it today in the face of evil that is happening around us. Now I wanna show you one more image, perhaps you saw it this week, of the families who are leaving their homes and going to the train station. I read that there were many people who were trying to get on the train so they couldn't take everything with them and so they took what they could. They held their children to their breasts in fierce protective love and they grabbed a, 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 a small suitcase. And in the, when the ones that were going to Poland, in the Polish train station that arrived, they still had a ways to walk and carry their children and their babies. And we don't know if it was the first mothers who arrived in the train station at Poland who left their strollers for the next arrivals, or if what we see happening now is that the Polish mothers are dropping off strollers at the train station, so any mama arriving with a baby can grab a stroller and walk the rest of the way with uh, less of a load. But either way, some mothers saw the need for strollers and, and, and cared for the moms who were caring, for their ba carrying their babies and toddlers across many, many miles and placed them around this train station for any mother to take. And the image was just simply a train and six or seven strollers. It's a powerful image. It's a gift. A gift for the travelers who abandoned their houses in search of safety. A gift for the strength for the journey. A gift of compassion. A gift of welcome. When I saw that stroller picture, I thought about our own borders and some of the gifts that were given by beloved people. We have a mission statement logo here that we use uh, that we are trying to live by at Paradise Valley. It's God's love in action. And these Polish women were exactly that. God's love in action for the bone-weary families who still had a way to walk. So I'm thinking about the world today. Are you? Has it been on your mind? Have you been thinking about things that are heavy? I'm thinking about all the horrors we've experienced in life, not just the one we are living through, but others. And sometimes I just like to sit down with Jesus and have Jesus commiserate with me, hear how awful it is, and agree with me that, it's, that the evil is too much. But according to the scripture, Jesus would only be interested in hearing about my own life. He would want to know my own places where I've gone wrong. He would want to hear my own confession. He would want to know if I understand my need for repentance because the log in my own eye is big enough. Abandoned houses, strollers, my need to be humble and to repent. In the light of everything 
that's going on in this world. This is something we can do. And this is the scripture's lesson for the day. I told you, you weren't going to like it. Oh God. It's easy to see the ways other people have gone wrong. And God, we do ask that you would help us to stop the injustices that happen in our world. But please, before we go there, God, remove the log in our own eyes. Help us to see the places where we personally need to repent. And God, receive our repentance and take the dust and the manure of our lives and make something beautiful, something fruitful. Please, God, we need your help. Amen. Well, today is uh, the Sunday, one of the Sunday when the children are with us. And we decided a little while back that every time the, sun, the children are with us in worship for the whole service, we are going to do Holy Communion so that they could experience Holy Communion um, with us as well. So would you like to lift up the bread and wine? So the Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, lift up the Lord. we want to remember today that we come here to give thanks and praise for all that God has done for us. And remember that God is holy and not, uh, not like us. That God is righteous and lifted above us. And remember that our holy God suffered, died, and rose again, gave birth to the church, and delivered us from the slavery of sin and death, and made us a new covenant people. And so in the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks to you, and broke the bread, would you break it? And gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant which is given for you and for many. Every time you gather together, eat of this bread. Do so in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And he lifted it and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Which I like to remind us, if we need to be forgiven, this cup is for us. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of all God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we come today in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Oh God, we pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who are gathered here in this room. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we might be that for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and in your holy church. For all the honor, all the glory is yours now and forever. Amen. Would you say the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If the communion service would please come and help us prepare to receive, um, as soon as they bring the, the baskets out to you, you can come forward, and they will hand you a, a cup that has two sections in it. Take off the first layer, and you'll see the bread. Peel back the second layer, you'll see the juice. You can be ready to do that, and, but I will come um, at the end when everybody has their cup and is sitting back down, and we will partake together. So come. Remember, the communion table is open to all. Let us eat and drink together.
And now if you tear back the first layer and take the wafer, you can break it if you'd like. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then tear back the second layer. This is the cup of forgiveness given for you. Thank you, God, for being present to us in the Holy Communion table, in the sharing of community, and in the love that you have shared with us. Amen. Before we do the announcements, I have, um, or as we do the announcements, um, I want you to pay attention to a few things that are in your bulletin. If you're online, you can see that we are having an Easter carnival on April the 9th from 10 to noon. We welcome all families to come and help us uh, celebrate Easter that weekend. And then Confirmation Weekend is coming up. It's April 1st through 2nd, so if you'd like to sign up your child for Confirmation Weekend, be sure to connect with Ben. And then um, today at 5.30, we're going to have a prayer service for Ukraine. We have um, a special candlelight service planned, some reading of some scriptures, some prayers, and just a, a time for you to, to release to God and to pray for the people who are suffering so much during this time. There will also be a place for you to donate if you'd like to donate to uh, UMCOR, who is helping to uh, prepare some of the needs for the people of Ukraine that are, tr that are traveling to different places. One of the best things about being United Methodist is that we have UMCOR, and UMCOR helps us so much in the world. So we hope to see you there. It'll be in the chapel tonight. And now receive this blessing, this benediction from God as you leave this place. God asks us to walk the earth with humility. And God asks us to search inside of our own souls before we go and change our world. So this week, reflect on the ways that God is remaking you. And take this year to let God grow in you beautiful fruit and share that fruit with a world that needs to know that God loves them. And do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.